Welcome again to DWPFP. We are now in the third and final segment of Week 3, Part 1 of Historical Background and Overview of Philippine External Relations, where we go over briefly the short-lived Philippine Republic. For those who have just tuned in to this podcast, we are continuing the thread of the last one, where we left off at the start of the Philippine Revolution. Any key information? There are parallels to be drawn between the Philippine Revolution and the independence movements of the Spanish Americas. I think that's the one thing that I want to lead off from, which, um, um, if you remember, uh, took place in the general political and intellectual climate that uh, was in the uh, early uh, 19th century that emerged from the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, That was the 18th century. When we talk about Age of Enlightenment, it's usually... um, the entire uh, 18th century, 1700s, Age of Enlightenment, and that um, uh, this this climate influenced all of the what we call the Atlantic revolutions, including the earlier revolutions of the United States in 1776, and uh, which culminated in 1776, and uh, France, which uh, if you remember the fall of Bastille, it started in uh, it was in 1789. A more direct cause um, of the Spanish-American Wars of Independence were the unique developments occurring within the Kingdom of Spain and its monarchy during this era, starting from the Napoleonic invasion in 1808. So um, just to, of course, for those of you who do know, but uh, unless you do know, but in any case, um, after the fall of the monarchy in France in 1789, it went through the period of terror, eventually leading to uh, the... um, the rise of Napoleon in the uh, middle um, 1790s, um, which eventually uh, see him rise to become to become the supreme power or the leader in France, uh, revolutionary France, and then taking leadership because of his uh, military and um, uh, basically management genius. So starting with the Napoleonic invasion in 18, 1808, French occupation of Spain, because, you know, in... in Spain was invaded uh, by France in 1808, occupied um, later on that that very same year, which led to the abdication of Charles IV and his son and heir, Ferdinand VII. So by 1833, um, the um, whole uh, Spanish-American Wars of Independence started, you can say it started in 1810, because Spain had become so weak by then. So by 1833, only Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Pacific Pacific possessions, namely uh, the uh, Marianas and uh, and Guam, remained uh, among all of Spain's colonies. One can therefore argue that the Philippine Revolution, 1896, and this is like way after the latter part of the 19th century, right? Just like the Cuban War of Independence that erupted in the previous year in 1895 were the result of the liberation movements of the late 18th uh, late uh, ninth, late 18th century in that sense um you have um, a kind of 100 hist- year history or even a bit more starting from the american revolution the french revolution going through the uh, spanish uh, american Revolu- uh, wars of independence all the way up to um uh, in the late 1890s, you have the Cuban uh, War of Independence and the Philippine Revolution. You could actually take it from a historiographer's perspective as um, like a string of liberation movements uh, all throughout um, from one century from uh, the late 18th century. So there are mar- many parallels that can be drawn, like the British invasion. Um, when we talk about Cuba and, and um, the Philippines, the British invasion and occupation of the port cities of Havana and Manila, the repeated Uh, The repeated uprisings against Spain all throughout the 19th century, the martyrdom of the leading propagandists of each country. In uh, the case of Cuba, you have Jose Marti, and in the Philippines, you have Jose Rizal. Uh, The involvement of the United States through the Spanish-American War, and finally, the cession of Spain to the the territory, in this case, respective territories uh, from Spain to the United States of America, uh, in the uh, Treaty of Paris. So you can see um, even within um, this kind of twin revolutions or war of independence, shall we say, of, of Cuba and the Philippines, you can already see a lot of parallels. So apart from the germination of revolutionary ideas, did any foreign nations get involved in assisting the Philippine Revolution? Um, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, or as far as um, historians can tell, um, there wasn't, but it didn't mean that there was no attempt. 
notably, uh, there was a great interest in the Philippines in uh, um, Japan, especially during this time. Japan itself was uh, modernizing in what we now uh, call the Meiji era. So there were some nationals in the Meiji era and they were quite interested. They were maturing as a nation, modernizing very quickly. And they were interested in a fellow Asian nation that was um, headed just a few steps uh, behind, headed towards the same, same direction, but without the same um, perhaps um, skill or, or um, sense of, of unity. And um, of course, um, this Japanese perspective uh, came about from the view taken by, um, well, the interest, uh, sorry, not just Japan, I meant, was um, from the view taken by many nationalists in a number of Asian countries and ideas and, and areas, including the Philippines after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895, um, where all of these uh, different budding independence or liberation movements and their leaders thought of Japan or looked towards Japan as the potential source of aid in furthering their aims um, towards either um, reform, um, kind of redefining the relationship with their uh, colonial uh, masters, or um, leading towards independence. In fact, uh, the Katipuna, and of course the secret society from which um, the, the revolution itself uh, exploded, sent several members to Japan to obtain weapons and military assistance. This coincided with the interest a number of Japanese military authorities, politicians, and Pan-Asianists had in the um, Philippine independence movement. Japan eventually offered military assistance to the Philippines, sending the Japanese warship Congo to Manila in May 1896. Um, with uh, Morihiro Tagawa, a pioneer in the Japanese business community in Manila at the time, serving as the go-between, the captain of the Congo even met Andres Bonifacio and other Katipunan leaders um, to uh, discuss the possibility of getting arms. Um, despite concerns about the risk to Japan's harmonious relations to the West, which, you know, uh, Japan thought it necessary to actually cooperate um, with, with the West and able to, to, for it to be able to secure a revision of the unequal treaties with the European powers, Japan still um, dispatched a contingent consignment of arms and ammunition to the Philippines. Unfortunately for the Filipino revolutionaries, the ship, um, well, according to historical records, the ship Nonobiki uh, Maru, Nunobiki Maru, uh, was which, uh, in which they sent off um, with all the arms and the, the ammunition, basically was lost off uh, Shanghai by typhoon and no weapons actually reached uh, the destination. I have heard this before. There have been other revolutionaries who were inspired or sought help in Japan, like Sun Yat-sen, father of modern China, and Rash Bihari Bose, father of the Indian National Army, right? Well, yeah, right. I've, I've only read about that myself. Um, there was a standoff in the revolution that uh, resulted in a truce uh, between, well, the Re Philippine Revolution, I'm saying, right? Um, that resulted in a truce between the combatants. And in fact, it was uh, during this time um, that uh, there were some opportunities for uh, Filipino revolutionaries to get some help from outside. Now, um, after this standoff with between um, the Spanish authorities and the Fili Filipino revolutionaries, where neither one could gain a significant um, advantage, as part of the agreement, uh, which was called the Pact of Biak Biakna Bato, and I'm sure our listeners have heard about it, Aguinaldo and his fellow revolutionaries were to be given amnesty and monetary indemnity by the Spanish government, if on condition that they actually go into invol uh, to voluntary exile in Hong Kong, a British colony of the time. And so off they went, staying just a little over five months in 18, um, 1898. Um, so in 1898, as conflicts continued in the Philippines, so they were there, I think, um, if I remember correctly, from December 1897, uh, just a few um, months after the Pact of Biak Nabato was uh, finalized. And then they, they stayed in, in, in Hong Kong um, for, for about five months. So uh, in the new year, 1898, as conflicts continued, even though there was supposed to have been a truce, of course, not everybody followed and there were still... Um, um, areas in the Philippines where uh, Spain and, and the uh, Filipino revolutionaries were fighting, um, there were some concerns, of course, um, what was going to happen. And in through this um, kind of um, gray zone or area, uh, stepped the, into this, this zone, the United States. And 
And uh, of course, as those of you who are quite familiar with this chapter of Philippine history, the USS Maine, having been sent to Cuba because of U.S. concerns for the safety of, of its citizens during an ongoing Cuban revolution, exploded and sank in Havana Harbor, triggering the start of the America, Spanish-American War. Now, this conflict provided the pretext for the U.S. Um, Asiatic uh, Squadron to attack uh, Spanish Pacific Squadron in Manila Bay in May 1898. The U.S. was indeed a latecomer to imperialism, although many Americans still argue that the United States was not, and still is not, an imperialist power. So in that sense, the Philippines just had the good fortune of timing its revolution in the waning years of one empire, Spain, but the misfortune of trying to achieve nationhood precisely during the rise of another, the USA. Yes, and even though this fateful lunge for independence was intended for Filipinos to finally take into its own hands its national destiny. Indeed, there was already a sense of nation nationhood here, make no mistake, as the simultaneous um, struggles uh, emerging in the archipelago, at least in the Spanish colonial settlements in Luzon, Visayas, and parts of Mindanao, did aspire to be uh, one nation at the time of Phil the Philippine at the time of the Philippine Revolution or by the time the Philippine Revolution entered its second phase after the brief uh, self-exile in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, this um, lunge for independence or this attempt at independence was, it seemed not, it was not, was not meant to be. So, you know, it was meant to be the first experience by Filipinos um, at national self-rule. Remember, under Spanish, under the Spanish, or under Spanish rule, the Philippines was just a captaincy general under the vice royalty of New Spain or at um, what we now call Mexico. So um, before uh, the revolution, the conduct of foreign relations was entrusted by the Span to the Spanish governor general, if at all, with some meddling uh, by the clergy and the elite, and likely focused uh, mainly on commercial relations, that is, making um, um, the, uh, the governance of the Philippines profitable for Spain. Of course, with the loss of most of Spanish America, as I've mentioned already, to the wars of independence in the early 19th century, came the need for Madrid to establish direct rule uh, over the Philippine Islands. So you're right in saying that Spanish power was, at that time, in when the, the Philippine Revolution um, erupted in, in 1896, that Spanish power was indeed on the, on the wane. It was uh, definitely costly to run the colonies um, directly from Spain. And after 1815, when the Manila Galleons were terminated, um, there wasn't really much of a sustainable or lucrative source of revenue uh, coming from the islands to benefit uh, the metropolitan, which is uh, the metropolis, which is Spain. So in a way, one can say that sooner or later, Spain would have lost its grip entirely um, of its far-flung colonies if one were to look at the parallel experience of Cuba. Yet, when the Philippines finally had a chance to become independent and, for the purposes of our course, steer its own foreign policy, the new republic slammed into the wall that was the emerging global power, the United States of America. Yes, that's it, right? As, as short as that experience may have been, it certainly was hopeful for at least a few months in 1898. And definitely, it's, it's a bit sad that it's actually... Um, Pretty much in, in until 1898 uh, or maybe a uh, one month in 1899 that that they they still had that illusion of, of, of um, self governance uh, or that at least the the fate uh, their own fate was in their hands. So um, just coming from the the last part uh, of the story um, of Manila Battle of Manila Bay and every everything three weeks after this battle, Aguinaldo returned to the Philippines to establish a dictatorial government on 24 May 1898. Um, and so the whole idea here of Aguinaldo was that the United States came to our aid as a friend, as in an ally. And of course, uh, with his homecoming, um, this set the stage for um, the Declaration of the Philippines, um, Declaration of Independence from Spain on uh, 12th of June, 1898. Now, following this proclamation of independence, Aguinaldo established um, a revolutionary government on the 23rd of June, 1898, I, I hope you're following all these dates, under which the Philippine Foreign Affairs Marine and Commerce, that's actually what it was called, 
Department of Foreign Affairs, Marine and Commerce was established with Apolinario Mabini at the helm. And I think earlier um, in the previous podcast, we already talked about a scene in the movie General Luna why Apolinario Mabini was sitting all the time. So anyway, um, three months later after this, the Malolos Congress convened on t- uh, 15th of September to write a constitution. So... Um, when we say uh, with pride that the Philippines was the first republic in um, the first republic in Asia, uh, we have to qualify that, I guess, by saying that we were the first one with a constitution. So um, not just simply that the, that we were the first republic, but we were the first constitutional republic, we can say. Because um, let me just say on a side note, the Republic of the Philippines um, in 1890, shall we say 1899, I think it was established. Uh, I'm going to go through that later on. Um, was established, was predated by the Lanfang Republic in Borneo, uh, which was established in 1777, by the Republic of Ezo, which is the other name, older name of Hokkaido in Japan, which was established in 1869, and by the Republic of Formosa, established in 1895. Now, if you're going to be pedantic about it, you can even say that the um, uh, Ma- Mahajan, Mahajanapadas, um, of course, it's again referring to India, uh, 16 kingdoms that existed in northern ancient India from the 6th to 4th centuries BCE was also a kind of republic. So um, we have to actually qualify when we uh, say with pride that the Philippines was the first republic. We were the first um, republic with the constitution. But anyway, going back to the topic, when we um, when we note that um, it it was definitely a, a republic with a constitution in the sense that we drafted it with um, representatives from the people, uh, although only part of them was um, were actually um, elected. Another part of this body was actually appointed by Aguinaldo, and uh, of course they also had uh, representatives not just from the islands of Visayas and 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 um, Luzon. Uh, we also had a uh, representative from Sulu, or rather there was an invitation for a representative of Sulu, but there definitely was a representative from uh, what is now the Republic of Palau. Interesting. It does seem that from the other examples that by the late 19th century, there was a growing wave of independent movements in Asia following those in Europe and South America in the early and mid 19th century. Yes, um, and, and yes, of course, we, we actually call this the first Philippine uh, Republic, right? Um, and then it's part, we can say it's part of this uh, long wave of, of, of independence movements. And we were able to, we managed to, to actually declare ourselves or proclaim ourselves a republic. But there is also one way that, um, you know, just to take the uh, opposite um, op- uh, opinion or view, that one can argue that the Philippines wasn't really a country or state despite this proclamation. You see, under the general accepted principles of what constitutes a state, as laid out formally in the Montevideo Convention on Statehood in, of 1933, there are actually four requirements of statehood. Number one, you have to have a permanent population. Number two, a defined territory. Number three, a government. And number four, the capacity to enter into relations with other states. So in at least two of those conditions, it was not very clear whether we met the bar. Which one are these? Well, uh, we didn't have, number one, a clear defined territory since the highlands in Luzon and parts of Mindanao under Muslim rule were definitely not represented in the Malolos constitution. As I mentioned to you earlier, um, I think an invitation was sent to uh, Sulu, but this invitation was ignored. So um, I don't suppose they, that, that Mindanao or some parts of Mindanao at least um, had any representative. Oh, I thought by then we had some meets and bounds already defined. No, um, yes, you're talking about the, the uh, sorry, the, uh, the defined um, territory, right? Clearly defined territory. No, that did not really happen legally until the Treaty of Paris. We did have uh, geographical or navigational maps used by um, seamen um, to, to make sure that uh, they could uh, actually um, avoid uh, dangerous parts at sea and whatnot. But um, for all intents and purposes, um, this was not um, something that, that constituted um, a claim of, of um, the, 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 the bounds of the, of the nation, right? But anyway, um, 
uh, we can actually say that the first uh, legal document happened uh, did not happen until the Treaty of Paris. So, um, but but that's um, perhaps much later that we can tell that story. But I'm I'm definitely getting ahead of myself. Then of course. Um, the other one is that we did not actually receive international recognition. So I have to say, though, that the short-lived Philippine Republic tried um, to meet uh, all these four conditions, but um, they did fall short. Now, realizing the need for international rec recognition by um, for, for the new government, Aguinaldo assigned Mabini the difficult task of establishing diplomatic relations with friendly countries, members of the Hong Kong junta, um, you see that group uh, who actually um, went into exile into Hong Kong uh, way back in um, late seven, uh, 1897 and uh, early 1898 um, were sent uh, as the country's emissaries to France, Australia, Japan, and the United States. Alas, none of these diplomatic missions was successful. Nonetheless, the uh, Malolos Constitution was drafted um, by the uh, delegates. And then it was proclaimed on uh, the 22nd of January, 1899, 1899, creating what is known today as the First Philippine Republic, with Aguinaldo as, as its president and Malolos as its seat of government. And um, any sense that a new normal, however, was being established uh, with, you know, having its own, proclaiming its own republic, having a constitution, having not just, um, you know, Aguinaldo, a whole cabinet, in fact, uh, as mentioned, um, and um, even its seat of government in Malolos, you'd think that we were headed towards a, a seat of a, a kind of new normal, right? Um, but any feeling that this was actually happening uh, eventually dissipated in a matter of two weeks after the 22nd of January, because on February or 4th of February, hostilities erupted between the U.S. and Filipino forces in the Second Battle of Manila. Um, and from then on, it was um, the, the new government was um, simply on war footing and did not function very much as a regular government. The cabinet just met a few times um, after that and then was event eventually dispersed. And there was even, um, th I read somewhere that uh, even General, uh, General Luna arrested some of the cabinet members. And um, the DFA itself uh, was uh, dissolved on 7th of May, 1899. So, um, as you can see, um, the rest of it, uh, from then on, as the year went on, and then the next year, basically, um, the government being led by uh, President Aguinaldo was just at war with the United States of America. And the First Republic itself was effectively ended less than a week after the arrest of Aguinaldo in Palanan, Isabela, by American forces on 23 March 1901. All in all, just over two years, uh, essentially, as a, as a, as a republic. But I guess we will have to look to our real experience in foreign policy in the next segments. So listeners, please stay tuned to next week for part two of historical background and overview of Philippine external relations. For now, this is our facilitator and instructor, Derek Atienza, and myself, Stephanie Soares, signing off from DWPFP.